First and foremost, Dr. Malati, very much appreciate the invitation, very much appreciate the introductions. I really wish I was able to uh, join your live. I was very much looking forward to visiting the center, uh, to getting familiar uh, with uh, the uh, attendees of this uh, symposium, but unfortunately was not able to make it live. So let's make the best use of uh, the technology. And before I start, I really hope that all the attendees of the symposium will recognize how fortunate uh, you are uh, to have uh, the accessibility and uh, to have the care provided by the Gainesville Center of Excellence, which is one of the strongholds in the Parkinson Foundation family, one of the most uh, comprehensive centers uh, around the country and uh, globally. So again, just want to highlight uh, all the resources that are available to you at your center. And without further ado, I will get to the topic of my uh, presentation, which as Dr. Malati has alluded to, is therapeutic pipeline. These are my disclosures. I am a clinical trialist and I'm actively involved in therapeutic development on uh, a number of consulting uh, bases, and some of the programs that are listed that are, are listed here will be discussed in my uh, presentation. So the objective of the talk is uh, followed. Uh, follows uh, the title, What's New in 2023. I will start with a brief review of sim new symptomatic therapies and pipeline. I will have a couple slides on the current state of treatment of early Parkinson's disease. Uh, you will have a number of talks in uh, and discussions in the breakout sessions on the topic, so I'm not covering that in any extent. And what I really will focus on uh, is the primary area of my expertise, which is experimental therapies to slow disease progression, which obviously the topic that is very near to all of you in the audience. I will have a brief discussion on the clinical uh, ways uh, for the genetic uh, testing. Obviously, Dr. Paris is the glo global international expert on the topic. And again, you're fortunate to have him speaking uh, to you in one of the breakout uh, sessions. Let's start with kind of foundational uh, slides. I don't need to tell this audience Parkinson's is common. Parkinson's is the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. The estimated prevalence number of people living with the disease in the United States is about a million, and it's about 10 million globally. And as has been highlighted, by uh, the uh, chief of the uh, department at your institution, uh, Dr. Auken, along with the other authors, they call that emerging evidence of the Parkinson's pandemic. So obviously the population, it's not that for whatever reason, Parkinson's is becoming more common, but the population is aging. And as a result of that, all of us will be seeing more people living uh, with the disease, living longer lives. So it is up to our responsibility to provide the best quality of life as we're develop as we're working on developing better therapeutic options. Speaking of therapeutic options, again, Parkinson's is fortunate to have quite an armamentarium of medications to treat the motor syndrome of Parkinson's disease. And again, these are just the classes of agents and uh, the specific drugs in each uh, class. Um, as is highlighted, uh, Lividopa, Carbidopa Lividopa or Cinemat as a brand uh, name is the uh, cornerstone of any therapeutic of Parkinson's disease. It's the oldest drug that we have and still is the most effective and efficacious drug. And all the adjunctive therapies have been developed to extend the efficacy, extend the duration of the half-life of the drug. So again, compared to the other neurodegenerative diseases, we're way ahead in therapeutics. But on the other hand, we shouldn't rest on our laurels. 
And we'll talk about where therapeutic development needs to go. But before we go there, this is my kind of high level slide of comprehensive management of the disease. Obviously, pharmacological therapy plays an essential role in uh, compensating for the neurotransmitter for the chemicals deficiency. But the center part of the slide is essentially important non-pharmacological therapies. And again, it is a very high summary of everything that goes into that holistic, comprehensive management of a person living with the disease and their family uh, partners and so on. Education of the disease state, and that's the reason why you're at this symposium. Exercise, early physical therapy intervention, speech therapy, occupational therapy, all of these are essentially important. So really setting you on the path for the best compensation for the disease with a primary aim of quality improved and maintained quality of life. Nutrition, support services, social work services. And again, you are fortunate to have all of those at uh, your center. And then moving to the right are the therapies that are available under the umbrella of advanced therapeutic options when medications need to be supplemented with the surgical management. And again, it's out of the scope of the discussion, but again, Gainesville is certainly the pioneer in deep brain stimulation, focused ultrasound, and other evolving uh, advanced therapy options. Again, I'm starting with comprehensive care. My last slide will, about, will be about really self-management, wellness approaches to management of the disease. Now let's get to the slide that frequently is flashed in different talks, which provides kind of the holistic view of the timeline of Parkinson's disease, right? And on the right-hand side, the starting from the time point zero is when the person comes into the doctor's office and is given the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and the journey begins. And it starts with predominantly motor symptoms in majority of cases that respond well to the medications. And then with the time, people can develop what is called motor complications of the disease and therapeutics, what is labeled as fluctuations, drug-induced involuntary movements, dyskinesia. Both of these domains, we still have good therapeutic options to manage. And then as time evolves, disease progresses, people can step into the more advanced stages of the disease when the symptoms less responsive to medications in the motor domain, like balance problems, gait problems, freezing of gait, and in the non-motor domain, problems with speech, swallowing, cognition can dominate uh, the uh, overall management of the disease. So again, as I have said, we have good therapeutic options for the early disease, moderate stage of the disease. We certainly need better therapies for the advanced stages of the disease. Let's talk more about that. So, Let's address what we do well. And on the left-hand side of the slide is we have wide an armamentarium of therapeutics for management of early motor symptoms. We do have options for treatment of drug-induced involuntary movements. The term is dyskinesia. We do have a number of classes of drugs for the treatment of medications wearing off. And again, that will be covered more in the subsequent uh, talks. We do have medications, selected ones for treatment of the non-motor symptoms like drop of the blood pressure or prostatic hypertension, like mood dysfunction, like hallucinations. So again, we have to acknowledge that we have achieved a lot. But on the other hand, we also need to focus on where we need better therapeutics. And as I have started on the previous slide and continue here, treatment of more advanced motor symptoms, freezing of gait, balance, falls is an essentially unmet need. And in the domain of treatment of non-motor symptoms, cognitive dysfunction, certainly at the top of the list. 
But again, other domains of the non-motor disability, sleep, fatigue, and the other ones certainly can be quite bothersome for people living with uh, the disease. So um, we're talking about the future, we're talking about the pipeline, and again, if I really want you to walk away from this talk with a sense of optimism and sense of the optimism based on the therapeutic pipeline. So this is a busy slide, but it is good busy, right? So on the X axis at the bottom are the last 20 years of therapeutic development. And obviously the higher the bars, the more drugs are in therapeutic development. But what is important is that the colors are shifting to the orange and red, which means that there are more therapeutics getting closer to the approval, what is called phase three therapeutic uh, development. And again, look what is remarkable, despite the pandemic in the last three years, the pipeline only has been increasing. So again, will all of these drugs come to the pharmacy? Probably not. But again, obviously the more drug development, the more pharma is interested in therapeutic development in Parkinson's disease, the more we expect to have uh, better therapies uh, for people living uh, with a uh, disease. Now, very briefly, what are those new therapeutics on the horizon in the domain of motor indications? We started very briefly that levodopa, carbidopa levodopa, Cinemet brand name is the mainstream of management of the disease. It's the best drug that we have, but it does have its limitations. It has a very short half-life, which means that its concentration in the blood stays at the necessary level for a short period of time, and then it drops down especially for people with more advanced disease. And when the level of the drug drops down, people start having re uh, return of their symptoms, of the motor symptoms. So there has been keen interest in development of continuous delivery therapeutics like insulin pump, right? And we do have one that is approved, with, which is duopa, which is introduod, and also jejunum, apocolin, delivery of the drug, but they have been a number of therapeutics in development to have the under the skin, what is called subcutaneous infusion of uh, the therapeutics. And there are two programs that actually have completed uh, their studies that are developing exactly that, subcutaneous continuous infusion of levodopa or levodopa prodrug. Both of the studies have been completed, reported at the recent meetings. One is already in FDA submission. The other one in public domain, they announced that will be submitting uh, soon. So it is anticipated that these therapies will be on the market, hopefully by the end of the next uh, year. Again, very important additional therapy for the right indication, for the right uh, participants. Similarly, there is a drug in the class of dopamine agonist, apomorphin. Some of you are familiar with that because it's available as an injectable kind of a rescue therapy. It up until recently, it also was available as sublingual or under uh, the tongue uh, strip that uh, they stopped uh, promoting. So the drug has also been available for many years in Europe as a continuous uh, pump uh, infusion. And it is still in development to be brought on the US uh, market. So that is in the domain of people whose uh, levodopa oral does not work continuously. Now on the right hand, there are other indications for new drugs uh, on the pipeline. And you can see that there are a couple of them. And interestingly, again, in the middle is optimization of already existing drug. Uh, probably a number of you are familiar with uh, our commercially named drug right theory, which is extended preparation of carbidopa levodopa in the capsular form. And the company has developed another drug with a longer half-life, so more consistent, 
concentration in the blood. It is under review uh, with FDA and the data are not available when uh, it will become released. So again, as I have said, the pipeline is rich in the motor domain. Now, what about the non-motor symptoms? And as the slide alludes to, it's the major need and definitely we need more therapeutics. Again, as you can see, the field is kind of getting more active, but we definitely need more research into that, more understanding of what truly drives cognitive impairment associated with the disease. And the challenge is that it's more than one thing that is responsible for that. But again, it's rewarding to see that a couple companies are developing therapeutics with different mechanisms of action, specifically focused on the cognitive domain of the disease. So the field is hopeful, but definitely more work is needed. And now moving to the most, to the, uh, uh, where we'll spend most of the time, what are we missing? So we have good therapeutics for motor disability. We still need better. We certainly need to develop uh, therapeutics for the non-motor symptoms. But the other way to approach it, option to slow disease progression. So to delay, prevent the person getting into that more advanced stage of the disease. And again, I will be repeating that word of optimism and word of optimism. I am an optimist, but word of, on, of optimism based on the data. And look at this pipeline. This is really remarkable slide. And it is a remarkable slide for a number of reasons. The bottom very busy pie charts show you the classes and the names of different drugs in different stages of the development. Probably you're familiar with the fact that uh, phase one is the earliest phase of therapeutic development in human, in living uh, people. Phase three is when the drug goes uh, to the uh, regulatory agencies for approval and phase four is post -mar marketing studies. And look how many therapeutics are in the top of that right pie chart which are in the domain of disease modifying therapies. So again, that means that the field is having better understanding of the science behind that and more resources are being put into the development of therapeutics. So that is one remarkable part of the slide. The other remarkable part of the slide are the faces that are at the top of the slide. So these are the three authors of the annual paper that is published in Journal of Parkinson's Disease, which is open access, which means that it's available to you. So the screen shows 2021, there was an update in 2022, and there actually will be an update coming in 2023. And for those of you who want to know everything that is happening in drug development in Parkinson's, that is probably the best resource. That's the resource that we also go to. But the most remarkable part of that is that Three faces on the screen are three people, first authors of that uh, paper, and all of them are people living with Parkinson's disease. So it's remarkable that the Parkinson's community is really taking their ownership and clearly telling us we need better drugs, we need more drugs, and we are active participants in the process. And I would encourage you to do the same by participating in the studies and being informed as well. And you're doing that by attending today's uh, symposium. So again, a similar slide to what I've shown you a couple uh, other ones, therapeutic development over 20 years. And again, I hope that this clearly gives you the sense of optimism how really steep the curve of growth has been specifically in the last five years. So I now to talk about specific classes of drugs. And what I will highlight is therapeutics that are targeting pathological accumulation of alpha synuclein. Some of you are familiar with the term, some of you are less familiar with the term. So alpha-synuclein is the protein that exists in the, all the cells. It certainly, and it plays an important role 
We still don't have full understanding of its full role, but it plays an important role in connectivity between the cells and functionality between the cells. Why are we talking about it in the setting of Parkinson's disease? Because that is the protein that the pathologist sees on the cell cut as confirmation when it accumulates, aggregates, clumps, it becomes pathological and impacts the normal function of the cells. And again, this is the cut of the brain of a person with Parkinson's disease. So you can see that this area of the brain called substantia nigra has lost its coloring. It's that substantia nigra stands for uh, black and it lost its coloring because the cells uh, have uh, declined in the number and function. And if you look under the microscope of the uh, cells, then there are those brown bodies that are called Lewy bodies. And the major constituent of those uh, brown uh, of the Lewy bodies is synuclein. It was discovered in the late 90s as the uh, protein, protein signature of the disease. There is tremendous amount of data that, yes, it's directly linked to the pathology, to uh, the nature of the disease. So they're similar to Alzheimer's disease. There has been tremendous amount of therapeutic development trying to target that pathological synuclein to reduce its accumulation, to reduce its uh, uh, production, to improve clearing from the cells. And let's talk about some of those therapeutics. And I recognize that that is a busy slide, but really to illustrate what I've told you that in the normal conformation, it's a normal protein important to the cells. It is when it starts clumping, aggregating, and developing fibrils, it becomes pathological and it becomes toxic. So the key is to target the protein, the abnormal protein, to quote unquote, leave alone the normal uh, protein. And there are therapeutic development to multiple paths of that cascade. The ones that are most advanced are the therapies that actually target extracellular when that protein already left the cells. And those therapeutics are under the umbrella of the class of monoclonal antibodies. So let's talk about uh, that. Again, another fairly busy slide, but to show you all the classes of drugs, uh, probably not all inclusive, right? Uh, synuclein targeting therapies. And they're subdivided on the slide by monoclonal antibodies. And we'll talk about the studies that have read out and other approaches. So monoclonal antibodies deliver already ready to go antibodies that uh, are aimed to uh, meet that synuclein outside of the cells and clear it out of the body. The other approach is to develop a vaccine uh, that would develop the antibodies when, uh, once it already is in the body. And again, a couple of companies are pursuing that uh, approach. And in the bottom are the other approaches, uh, the molecules that reduce the aggregation, improve the clearance of synuclein. So again, a lot of therapeutic development. What has already read out? Some of you probably are familiar and probably participated in those studies, the front-running studies of monoclonal synuclein targeting antibodies that were run by Roche, which was the Pasadena study, and by Biogen, that was Spark uh, study. Those were phase two programs have read out, presented, and published. And unfortunately, both of the studies were negative. You can see the busy slides, two colors, one represents the active therapy, the other one are placebo, the are non-active comparator, and unfortunately there was no separation. In the Roche study, you can see that in the slides there is some separation in the secondary and exploratory outcomes. And that served as the foundation for them to continue the open label extension of the Pasadena study. Some of you probably are participating in it and to launch the part of a uh, study. So how should you react to this? Uh, on the one hand, excitement about the mechanism, excitement about synuclein targeting therapies. On the other hand, negative readout of the studies. 
So obviously concerning, but on the other hand, let me remind to you, the field of therapeutics in Alzheimer's disease that started at least 10 years before Parkinson's development of protein targeting therapies, it took 10 plus plus years. And this is the slide that summarizes all the studies that have read out negative until finally the field of Alzheimer's disease has celebrated the victories of three drugs that have read out positive. So why am I telling you? We will stumble, we will lose, we will have more negative studies, but as long as we are targeting the right mechanism, the, the field is very optimistic that we will hit that finish line. So now let's move into a couple other classes of drugs that are in development that you might have heard about. You might be participating in those uh, studies as a center. So one class of drugs that is being actively pursued is actually drugs that I approved for diabetes that are known as, known as glucagon-like peptide one class of agents. So why are the world the drugs, type diabetes drugs in Parkinson's disease? So this slide provides the summary. So there is some epidemiological evidence of increased risk of Parkinson's in people with diabetes, but the major reason is the potential multiple mechanisms that those drugs address that improve the health of the cells. So again, active area of our development, I will show you the slide that shows different uh, studies that are in uh, development. Uh, one of them has just recently read out negative, which is neurally study on the primary endpoint, but indicated that in younger uh, participants, there was signal of efficacy. So really we need more uh, data and the field is very interesting. Now let's move into another class of agents. And again, um, I'm highlighting a lot and if not because that is the drug in the current development, but really to highlight how cautious and responsible we as the scientific community need to be. And some of you probably know about nilotinib. There was a lot of hype about the drug in 2016 when a small open label study read out nilotinib is a cancer drug. It's approved for uh, management of uh, 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 Philadelphia chromosome uh, leukemia and for different mechanism of action, C able uh, tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitor. Uh, he has a role in uh, the biology of Parkinson's disease. A small uh, open label study read out showing significant benefit or reporting significant benefit in people with advanced Parkinson's disease obviously creating a lot of excitement in the community. The problem was that it was an open label study. It really was not designed to read out for efficacy. It was a safety study. And then there was a number of follow-up studies. One of them was run by Michael J. Fox Foundation and I was privileged to uh, run it. And unfortunately, but not unexpectedly, did not uh, support the positive results. And while still the mechanism of action is applicable, but nilotinib does not have a role in development for Parkinson's disease. And again, I am saying that because patients still sometimes will ask about it and whether they should try it because it's available in uh, the pharmacy. Obviously the drug has quite a number of quite concerning uh, side effects, but also really to highlight the ethical responsibility of us as a research community to communicate the data accurately, timely, and put it in the right context. So let's uh, move, uh, this is the conclusion uh, of the nilotinib uh, study. And again, as I have said, while nilotinib does not have a role in further development, but it doesn't mean that there are other drugs in the class.
Oh, we'll wait and see if she comes back. Oh, yep, she disappeared. Can you uh, hear me? Looks like I got disconnected. Uh, yes, you're back. Okay, let me resume the slides. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, perfect. And let's go back to, so that, that's where I believe I've been interrupted that there are a number of uh, other CAVL inhibitors in development. Next class, I know that I'm running very fast. I know that there is a lot of information, but I wanted to show, give you really the big uh, picture. So there are a lot of questions from the patients coming into the clinic. What is the relationship between the gut and the brain? Obviously they are located at the different ends of the body, but on a serious note, there is tremendous amount of interest in the impact of the healthy gut flora on the brain health and a number of neurodegenerative diseases. And specifically in Parkinson's disease, there was an interesting study published uh, by now a couple of years years ago, demonstrating that actually some of the people pathology might start uh, peripherally rather than centrally. Again, there still needs to be a lot of consensus, but uh, there is certainly rationale to talk to people about the nutrition, about healthy diets, about probiotics. Now, we really don't have the data to say which one and how much, and we need more research in that uh, domain. So again, speaking of the gut, there is a number of agents that are exploring more of the broad domain of the gut uh, inflammation microbiota, which is the constituency of uh, the gut, uh, both flora and genetic constituency that supports uh, that flora. So again, very interesting area of research, but much more data are, are necessary. Now let's get into the Next uh, topic of disease modification is Parkinson's and personalized medicine. And all of you have heard the word personalized medicine. Oncology is leading the effort, really. And what that means is rather than giving one pill to all the people with a diagnosis to identify the biology that drives the disease in that individual and personalize that therapy. So other fields are, are moving in that direction. It's logical, right? It makes sense. And what is leading the effort is what we call genetically targeted therapeutics. Overall, genetic monogenic Parkinson's disease is not that common. It's about 10% of people, but it has taught us a great deal about the rest of the 90%. Again, you will have a discussion on genetics of Parkinson's disease later, so I will really focus on the therapeutic uh, development. Right, and we'll the two genes that I want you to be familiar with are the most common, still not that common, right? Of the monogenic forms of the disease, GBA is really the risk uh, gene, and present in about ten percent of the overall PD population. Much more common in certain ethnic groups. Uh, LARC uh, two is present in one to three percent of. Uh, people with Parkinson's disease worldwide, again, much more common in certain ethnic uh, population. Why am I zooming on those two uh, genes? Because there are therapists in the clinical phase of the development that some of you might qualify for and may be interested in. So let's uh, for, uh, let's start with the large targeting therapeutics again. I am not discussing the biology behind that, but want to highlight two programs that are in the clinical development. One of them is oral small molecule LARC2 inhibitor being developed by uh, Biogen phase two study. And interestingly, they're testing that drug both in people with non-genetic Parkinson's disease and in a separate study in people with a LARC carrying 
parents in Parkinson's disease. So those studies studies are just starting. I actually am not sure whether your site is participating, but of great interest. The other uh, one is more invasive therapy. Uh, ASO stand for antisense oligonucleotides that are delivered through the spinal uh, tab. It is phase one study and their recruiting it has been going on for a while. So again, the data will be very informative to the field. Very quickly moving into the GBA targeting therapies. Again, you can see that the field is active, which means that we have have more signs to support that development. There is interest from the pharma community. And again, the quantity hopefully will lead uh, to the quality. Not without uh, failures, uh, Venglostat, which is the third row substrate reduction therapy, was a phase two study, the first ever genetically targeted uh, therapy, successfully recruited participants, successfully closed the study, unfortunately negative results. It doesn't mean that the other programs uh, do not have uh, hope because it was very much distant uh, to the origin of that uh, GBA and enzyme uh, increase. So again, a lot of interest. And now let's get into the last uh, part of uh, this very quick overview of genetic uh, therapeutics. So if we're developing genetically targeting therapeutics, how are we going to find these people? And then the question from you is, should I do genetic testing for Parkinson's disease? So again, you have both leading experts in uh, the field. I'm expressing my opinion as a clinical trialist. And what I'm stating is genetic testing is entering the clinic. So obviously there are, uh, talk to your physician first. Uh, genetic counseling is essential. It's a very sensitive area. So you need to know why you're doing it. What kind of results you anticipate? What do the positive results mean? What do the negative results mean? What are the implications for the family? And on the financial side, as of today, insurances frequently do not cover genetic testing, but there is a number of programs that are supporting uh, genetic testing for people with Parkinson's under the auspice of research studies. And one of them is actually supported by the Parkinson's Foundation, PD gene study standing for PD generation that offer, offers commercial uh, level uh, genetic panel for seven uh, Parkinson's uh, genes and again, available to the community at large. Michael J. Parks is supporting the efforts. Obviously there is direct to consumer uh, testing 23andMe, but be aware for those of you who have done that, it is a very limited uh, panel, does not cover the usual spectrum of uh, the genes. And I repeat, genetic counsel is essentially important to position it in the right way. Now we talked all this time about everything that is on the right side of the slide. What about the left side of the slide, right? And that is what we currently traditionally call prodromal state of the disease. What does prodromal mean? In the current terminology, it means that people have the signs and symptoms that are known to be associated with increased risk of Parkinson's disease, but they do not have the classical motor symptoms of the disease, right? What it means to me as therapeutic uh, developer is that these people already have developed the pathology that drives their symptoms. And if we have effective therapeutics, we could step into therapeutics in that phase to truly prevent them progressing to the motor Parkinson's or the cognitive features of the disease. So tremendous interest, tremendous opportunity, right? So I will talk to you about one uh, study, and again, you've seen in my disclosures that I'm actively involved in, which is Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative Study. You are one uh, of uh, the sites uh, in the study, so I suspect that uh, a number of you have been approached and familiar about that. The study is recruiting. It's an observational study. It is uh, the study that is aimed to develop biomarkers, kind of the biological 
signatures of the disease to advance the therapeutic development. But the reason I'm talking about that study in this perspective is because the study is actively now recruiting those what I've labeled as prodromal participants. And as some of you know, reduced sense of smell is present in about 80% of people who come into the clinic and say, and with a new diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and they say that I've developed loss of smell way before that. It certainly doesn't mean that everyone with a loss of sense of smell is destined to develop Parkinson's disease. But what that means is that it's a very interesting and important clinical sign that we can explore further and identify that early population. The other prodromal feature is dream enactment behavior, REM behavior disorder. There are other ones that you've seen on the slide. Again, for the economy of scale, we are focusing on those with loss of sense of smell, REM behavior disorder, genetic at risk individuals or people with positive family history. Again, we are recruiting them in that observational study. So I'm obviously uh, informing you about the study and asking you to spread the word and to work with your PPMI team at your site. And one of the very active initiatives that we are doing is we're going to the community and saying, help the research, help to advance the research. And what we're asking the community to do is very simple. Do the smell test and this QR code and all of you are familiar nowadays with a QR code uh, will get the people to and you can do the screenshot, please do right. We'll get you to the website where people ask just a couple of very simple questions and then they are ma being mailed uh, the smell test that they can do at home and send it back. And if we screen, and we need to screen more than 100,000 participants uh, worldwide to identify those people with what we call the staged risk paradigm to be further recruited and uh, followed. And now I'm coming to the closing uh, part of my talk, and hopefully I have not extended my time. Uh, while we're doing all this research, what should we tell the patients with Parkinson's disease who are living with their disease now? And I'm telling you the obvious, and you're fortunate to be uh, taken care of and have access to at uh, the Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence. So seek the opinion of a specialized center. Parkinson Foundation has a lot of educational materials that are all available at your center. Inquire about clinical trials, because if we don't have participants, the best therapists will never be tested. Uh, we have potent medications to treat Parkinson's symptoms today, and obviously have the sense of well-being and positive outlook that are so important. And again, this is not my acronym. I borrowed it from someone. I don't remember whom I borrowed it from, but I really like it. It's the acronym for the different definition of meds. And again, medications are essentially important, but self wellness and self-maintenance are very important. M stands for meditation, E stands for exercise, D stands for diet, and S stands, stands for sense uh, of well-being. So let's all exercise this acronym of MEDS in addition to pharmacological management of the disease, and let's exercise everything that is on the slide. I cannot speak more to the importance of self-maintenance, self-wellness behavior that will keep you in the best shape possible and will improve your quality of life. And with that, I will close. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present to you. This question, and Dr. Simoni, thank you for that fantastic overview. It's exciting to see all the different types of therapies that are being worked on and how much hope there is in the future. The question is targeted ultrasound. Is it safe and effective enough that it will soon be a common treatment in Parkinson's disease? I think we're talking about focused ultrasound. So thank you for the question. Um, I am not a surgical person, so I will give you my general neurologist uh, our perspective. Focused ultrasound stands for the new technology uh, that uh, offers the uh, opportunity to uh, deliver micro lesioning, so a tiny lesion in the targeted area of the brain that is now approved for management of essential trauma, different condition. 
and Parkinson's uh, trauma, and it's available at the centers that have uh, the technology. The data are positive that it's effective uh, for the management of that symptom. But as anything else, have a conversation with your physician. Your center is the global leader in advanced therapeutics. So you certainly have quite a number of experts who will give you very detailed discussion of the pros and cons. Yeah, I just wondered, you you mentioned when the transdermal, uh, Abby transdermal, I just wonder when that estimated to be available. Did you hear the question, Dr. Simone? I did not. Can you? Uh, okay, sure, yeah. With the subcutaneous <clears throat> levodopa, he specifically mentioned the AbV product. He was wondering if you had a comment about how soon that would become available. Okay, so you've seen it on my slide. What is available in the public domain is that it is under FDA review. They have just posted that FDA asked additional information about the pump. So again, hopeful that by the end of the year, we will have the definitive answers. I don't have more specific information. Okay, the question is gut health. Do you recommend certain foods to be avoided or to be enhanced in order to help? Is a cleanse routine okay? So the one question was with regard to gut health, what kind of foods are good or not good? And secondly, is a cleanse routine okay? okay. So I will tell you what we know today. There is no Parkinson's diet. There are some studies that are looking at different diets, what is kind of the usual recommendation to the patients, stay with a healthy diet that is good for your heart, good for your brain. Usually it is Mediterranean uh, diet with less of the uh, saturated uh, fats, with less of the red meat, more of the green stuff, everything that is colored vegetables, berries and so on is considered to be good for your brain. It is also referred to as MIND diet, M-I-N-D, right? But there is no specific Parkinson's diet. Uh, similarly, I've already alluded in my talk, there is a lot of interest in probiotics, basically, uh, the um, supplements that would keep uh, the healthy gut microbiota, but there are no studies to definitively make a statement, yes or no. Cleansing diet, I am not aware of uh, any studies. There are some studies on uh, the uh, uh, low carb uh, diets and so on. What I usually tell the patients, I will tell you what we know from the scientific evidence. I will tell you what we know is negative or harmful, everything else, make your better judgment. Okay, there's another question from the virtual audience. Can you suggest existing or trialing medications that might help with overnight rigidity, given that carbidopa, levodopas, uh, if somebody has failed carbidopa, levodopa, rapinarol, baclofen, and gabapentin? So maybe some general comment about uh, overnight yeah. wearing off. I will be very general. You have a talk on the management of motor manifestations of the uh, disease. So obviously that is the reflection of medication wearing off uh, at night. There are a couple strategies of long acting uh, levodopa uh, preparations, whether that's right theory or uh, the, the old uh, carbidopa levodopa CR. Uh, there is also a role for pump uh, delivery, which is Duopa. But again, this is a very gener generic response. You have a conversation with your physician. What is important for you to take away from that? Yes, there are options to explore. Thank you. And, and I definitely agree. Talk with your doc because we can always look at different options and the timing of your medicine. There's one more question in the virtual audience. So if anyone in the room has a final question, throw your hand up. But this may be the last question, Dr. Simuni. There is a recent study in Finland about the possibility that desulfobivrio bacteria 
So a particular bacteria is connected to clumping of proteins in the brain. Do you have any information about that? So actually need to look up that study, but all I would say need more data. We have a lot of exciting data coming from the animal models, from the animal studies, the way I usually make uh, a joke that we long time ago cured Parkinson's in the mice. Uh, humans are obviously much more complex species. So uh, all of that is exciting, but needs to be translated into the human data. Okay, I think everyone was so content with all the information they received that there's nothing left to ask. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Simuni, and we really appreciate you sharing what's in the pipeline for Parkinson's. Thank you very much for the invitation. And again, really wish I was able to be uh, with you. And again, you have an exceptional agenda uh, for the program for the rest of the day. Thank you very much.